Welcome to the Red Roof Recovery Show, a program to soften the path of recovery from either substance and or behavioral addictions. I'm your host, Tanya McIntyre. And this beautiful theme song that we're listening to is called Greatest Bravery. It's from the CD titled The Master Key. And it's from my friend, my mentor, a very talented singer-songwriter, musician, Russell Allen Scott. Thanks so much for this, Russell. I'm here with you to share my experience, strength, and hope around my own recovery from drugs and alcohol. And my aha moment, my epiphany, happened back in February of 2009, when the only model of recovery that was available to me was the 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And you'll often hear me say that AA saved my life and SMART recovery gave me my life back. SMART is an acronym. It stands for Self-Management and Recovery Training. And I've been a certified facilitator with SMART Recovery since 2018. And I hold regular weekly meetings on the Zoom platform. I think the whole world has migrated to Zoom now. You can access those meeting links at smartrecoverytoronto.com. And Red Roof Recovery, that is founded on the principles of SMART and also on Team CBT. They're both innovative and evidence-based programs that I have been using to abstain from my own addictions for many, many years. SMART is an evidence-based recovery program, and it's based on the techniques of cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, and also rational emotive behavioral therapy, and motivational enhancement therapy. And Team CBT, that is a clinically proven and evidence-based program created by my mentor, Dr. David Burns, who is also the author of this book, Feeling Good. And it's my other Bible. It is the new mood therapy, the clinically proven drug-free treatment for depression. And actually, Dr. Burns has even updated all of his work with another book called feeling great. So lots of resources to be found on his website at feelinggood.com. Team CBT uses a detailed format of techniques and tools to reprogram our core beliefs that are contributing to habits, addictions, illnesses, and various brain disorders. And the Smart Recovery Handbook, uh, you will hear me refer to this a lot as well, Uh, This is a great resource with all of the tools and techniques that is used in my recovery with SMART recovery. It is what it is. Oh, how I dislike hearing that statement from somebody. Oh, well, it is what it is. It kind of makes me feel like I'm being dismissed, disregarded, disrespected, distanced, just totally dissed. I don't like it at all. But you know what? The thing about things that we actually label as bad is that they really aren't bad, are they? They just are. For instance, this virus isn't evil. This economic depression isn't malicious. They're just circumstances. They're unfeeling. They're indifferent. They are inhuman events. The impact they have on us humans, however, well, that's not quite so neutral at all. The fact remains, though, that they're just things. They just are. But is that supposed to be a comfort to someone who has just lost someone, especially if you've lost someone to this virus? Or is it supposed to be a comfort to someone who has lost a job to the economic fallout? Absolutely not. No amount of semantics can explain away a death toll or mend a broken heart. But I just want to take a moment to reflect on the economy. You know, because people who actually work in the market they're much less concerned about whether this market is good or bad, right? They know that the job that they have is to work with it just as it is, no matter what it is, every single day. They know that they have to adapt themselves to what is happening, make the most of it, just struggle on, just keep going. Hmm, (laughs) that sounds really familiar. It's exactly what we people in the recovery circles do every single day of our lives and our recovery journey. So very easy to get frustrated and angry about everything that threatens our existence and our comfort. It takes a concentrated and deliberate effort to rise above all the injustice, all the corruption, all the ignorance, and all the noise of divisions. It just never stops. It's everywhere. 
But along our recovery trail, we have learned that we can't take anything personally or be deceived by our expectations, which I don't know about you, but I always set mine pretty high. And I've learned that it's not what happens to me, but rather how I respond to what happens to me that is key in my successful recovery. I'm recording this edition of the Red Roof Recovery Show just two days after the death of my maternal aunt. She was more of a mother to me than her sister, actually. And I'm grateful that we managed to repair our estranged relationship. And uh, we enjoyed very many years of a treasured relationship. I'm going to miss her presence in my life. She was a constant source of love, encouragement, and support. And anyone challenged by addictions is especially vulnerable when our emotions are peaked. So my emotions right now are very peaked. I'm feeling very vulnerable. So how am I going to maintain my sobriety while I deal with these heightened emotions? Well, thankfully, I'm strengthened by the work I've done to maintain my successful history of abstinence. And I have a plethora of tools and techniques from both Team CBT, feeling good, feeling great from Dr. David Burns, and also SMART, the self-management and recovery training that you will hear me talk about a lot. So, of course, I'm still very emotional about my aunt's death. And my husband suggested today that I should actually talk about that. And I wasn't really sure if I'd be able to get through 30 minutes without being very emotional and perhaps even crying. And I know that Nobody wants to watch other people cry for any length of time. So I am going to um, just soldier on here and get through this 30 minutes with you without crying. Promise. I still think it's important, though, that we talk about emotions and how important it is for us to learn how to manage those emotions. As I said, my recovery journey started back in 2009 And it has not been a linear journey by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I started with a 30-day rehab program in 2009, and that was based on the 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous, AA. And you will often say, without AA, I don't think I would be here. That set the foundation of my recovery uh, without question. However, after about eight, nine years going to AA and NA meetings, A lot of my friends were not returning from their relapses. And that gave me pause for thought. Uh, Even though that program was working for me, it wasn't working for a lot of my friends. And I was going to too many funerals. And I didn't want to continue going to funerals. So I went looking for an alternative, perhaps a more inclusive secular program that I could offer to my community at the time. So when I went looking for an alternative in the addiction recovery landscape, there were not many things available. And I resonated immediately when I stumbled upon SMART recovery uh, for a few reasons. Uh, One is that it's founded in Mentor, Ohio. And I love that because mentorship has been uh, a key component in my own recovery process. And also, I really liked the fact that it was based on cognitive behavioral therapy, which is basically just Uh, directing rational analysis inward, just questioning all of our thoughts, right? Those, I call it the committee in my head. It just keeps rotating on a loop and it never (laughs) shuts up. So cognitive behavioral therapy really helps me uh, interrupt that loop and start questioning whether or not the negative thought patterns that seem to creep into that committee in my head, that loop, uh, it, it forces me to take pause and do the work, do some exercises, either from the Smart Recovery Handbook or uh, the lots of resources available in the feelinggood.com website or the book from Dr. David Burns. And when I take pause and do that work to reflect on what's actually creating my negative thought patterns, and then I can go through certain processes. And there are literally hundreds of things that we can do to process our emotions. Lots of um, tools, right? Instead of schools of therapy, I tend to focus on the tools of therapy. And there are literally hundreds of things that we can choose from. And one of my favorite tools is called the hula hoop 
tool of cognitive behavioral therapy. The hula hoop tool is basically a metaphor for setting boundaries, something that I have been challenged with all of my life. So this hula hoop tool of cognitive behavioral therapy helps me to stay focused on what's within my control. Do you remember the hula hoop from the 70s? You know, that little plastic tube that we would swing around our hips. I think it actually came back in the 90s. And that metaphor helps me stay focused on what's inside of my hula hoop, right? It helps me handle the stresses of my daily life and the stress that comes from heightened emotions, like the grief that I'm experiencing right now. And better stress management is a proven way to deal with urges and to succeed at long-term recovery. At least it has been for me. Dr. David Burns, one of my favorite quotes from Dr. David Burns is that a crucial predictor of recovery is having a persistent willingness to exert some effort to help yourself. And it's, nothing has been further than the truth. If I continue to do the work, uh, even 12-step programs like AA say, you do the work when you do the work, it works. So how does the hula hoop tool work? Well, just I, I just want you to imagine the hula hoop, right? That ring of plastic that we used to uh, jiggle around and get some exercise with. But let's first start recognizing that we spend a lot of our time and energy, at least I did, trying to affect the outcome of things that are beyond that boundary, that hula hoop, beyond my hula hoop, beyond my control. We get angry and frustrated by our inability to control certain things. And this anger and frustration can sometimes create triggers, or what I like to call activators, that can lead to urges, and that can lead to a lapse or a relapse. One of the other things I love about Smart Recovery is that it distinguishes between the lapse and relapse. So a lapse is considered just, just what that, that says, right? It's a lapse of judgment. And I have had several since 2009 lapses of judgment when I've been in social situations and uh, not have a, an accountability partner with me. And, you know, suddenly the tray of wine is making its way around the room. And I've been tempted more often than not to have a glass thinking that I can just have one glass. So that's a lapse of judgment because it doesn't take long for me to recognize uh, that I'm never going to be able to have one glass of wine ever in my life. This is something that is part of my life, and acceptance has been a key component of my recovery, uh, stopping that urge to um, fight this reality of mine that I have a substance use disorder. I am never able to manage myself around substances, alcohol, and drugs. So once that acceptance took me many years to finally learn from the experiences of several lapses uh, and why I love SMART for distinguishing between a lapse, which is that uh, lapse of judgment where you can think that you can get away with one or two. And then there's a relapse where a lot of my friends fell into that vortex of hopelessness and didn't come back. And the relapse is more than a lapse, is that it lasts more than a day or two or three. It lasts a week or two or three, maybe even one, two, three years. And many times uh, people don't return from that. And I have every confidence that if I were to ever relapse, I would not return, which is what helps me maintain my sobriety. So now let's get back to that hula hoop technique. Imagine that we have that hula hoop around our own waist all of the time. And now other people have their own hula hoop around their own waist. That's the heck of a lot of hula hoops in the world, isn't it? Everybody's going around with their hula hoop. And all these hula hoops are crashing against each other all day long. And inside our hula hoop is all the things we can control. Our body, our thoughts, our opinions, our values, our dreams, our ambitions, and our actions. Outside the hula hoop, all the things I cannot control. So basically everything, <laughs> everything else, right? Especially other people, what they're thinking, what they're doing or not doing, it's all beyond my control. And I was amazed to realize how much time I was spending in other people's hula hoops. 
And I catch myself sometimes still thinking, am I in my own hula hoop or am I in somebody else's hula hoop? So it's that awareness. And I was constantly worried about whether or not I was offending somebody, disappointing someone. Did I make them angry? Do they like me? Did they ever like me? La, 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 la. I used to spend my days crashing into the hula hoops of other people, overstepping my boundaries, worrying about things that were simply out of my control, getting into other people's business. Things like saying things like, oh, he treats you terribly. You should just leave him. Why are you staying? You need more exercise. You know, you, walking is a good form of exercise. They say swimming is good. Uh, you know, it's just getting into other people's hula hoops. It's none of my business. Uh, have you found a job yet? It was another thing I found myself saying recently. And then my husband's biggest pet peeve with me is when I continue asking him, are you going to retire? When are you going to retire? I want you to retire sooner than later. When are you going to retire? Right? None of my business. Not within my control. And when I finally learned to stay out of other people's hula hoops and remain inside my own hula hoop, I'm much better at managing my own thoughts feelings, behaviors, and less concerned with other people's thoughts and actions. When I stay focused on my own core values and goals, I can make better progress on things that are important to me. And when I stay out of other people's hula hoops, I actually affirm their right to have their own feelings, make their own decisions, say their own words, think their own thoughts. In other words, I'm respecting them. Now, that's not to say there won't be any disagreements with loved ones or friends or co-workers. And you know what? You may be absolutely right in your position on some disagreements. I know sometimes I can feel like I'm absolutely right in my position on certain things and I'm not willing to gravitate away from my opinions on things. And that can, that can set an unhealthy boundary sometimes with certain people. But even if I think I'm absolutely right in my position on some disagreements, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that I think I'm absolutely right. Being right about something that I can't control is as good as just being wrong about it. Right? <laughs> so it's all about the boundaries that we need to draw between our lives and emotional well-being and other lives and others' emotional well-being. So this hula hoop technique reminds me to let go of things I can't control and instead focus on the things I can control. My daily mantra is, what can I do from where I am with what I have right now? And that helps me stay focused on that. So some guidelines uh, for my serenity and peace of mind. I take responsibility for making myself happy. I resist the urge to blame others for my problems because I know that no one can make me feel anything without my permission. I give myself permission to make myself happy. It is not selfish. It's self-care. How many times in my life was I told that if I wanted to do something for me, that it was selfish? And that be becomes a, a core belief that t took me a long time to overcome. So I have reframed that, that it's not selfishness, it's self-care. And it is imperative to my recovery journey. Learning to love all that I am and resigning with good grace all that I am not. That's what my philosopher dad always used to say to me. And it took me many years to grasp the meaning of that. Learn to love all that you are and resign with good grace all that you are not. Because we're inundated with messages. About 3,000 advertising messages a day now telling us that we're never good enough. We're never rich enough. We're never smart enough. Definitely that we're slim enough. Never hairless enough. Until, of course, we go out and buy something or take something to feel better. So those messages can really get heavy over time and have us believing that we will always be inferior until we go out and buy something or take something to feel better. So learning to love all that I am and resigning with good grace all that I am not it's taking a long time. And it's still, you know what? It's still, I have to remind myself every day that I'm worth it. And the work that I've done through Louise Hay, the founder of Hay House Radio, has really helped me with that. Uh, part of my recovery homework in 2009 was to read the book by Louise Hay, uh, You Can Heal Your Life. 
And in that book, she talked about how one of the most challenging things that we do in our lifetime is learning how to love ourselves because we are inundated with messages from everywhere telling us that we're not good enough, we're not worthy. So it's, it's a process that takes a concentrated effort. And it's an effort that I, I wasn't willing to do for a very long time. So Louise Hay's suggestion that we do the mirror exercise, it's called, and you can YouTube Louise Hay mirror exercise, and you can actually learn it from her. She has passed on. Rest in peace, Louise. She was a very important mentor in my recovery journey and still is. Uh, Hay House Radio is still uh, her legacy, living long and strong. So the mirror exercise is something I've incorporated into my life, and it's not for everybody. So really important uh, for you to appreciate that what I'm sharing with you is what's worked for me and just suggestions that might be helpful for you. But I encourage you to find something that works for you and just keep doing more of that. Louise Hay's mirror exercise worked for me. It doesn't work for a lot of people. A lot of people have a hard time looking themselves in the eyes in the mirror. And one friend actually said that even though she had a hard time looking herself uh, in the mirror, deeply into your your own eyes, it, it's it's a it's a daunting uh, experience in the beginning. So she said she took a photograph of herself as a child, and she taped that to the mirror, and so now she talks to the child. So that's a good way to get around that. And it took me a long time to look myself in the eye, and to tell myself that I love you and you're worth it because I didn't love myself and I didn't think I was worth it for a long, long time. But something about Louise Hay resonated with me very strongly. She was like a mother figure, like a nice, warm, soft hug that I needed at the time. So I believed her when she said, you are worth it and what you practice grows stronger. So you just keep doing that. You keep trying to love yourself in the mirror. And I did. And I'm happy to say all these years later that it is part of my morning ritual. And it's, uh, I do love myself on most days. Making time for myself to do things and bring myself pleasure and enjoyment in the short term without sacrificing long-term goals. That was another thing because, you know, I sometimes I transferred one addiction for another. Uh, my addictions with drugs and alcohol, once I abstained from drugs and alcohol, it became work and I became addicted to work. So I wasn't caring for myself. I was spending way too much time at work. So making time for myself and recognizing that it, it was becoming unhealthy so, and then doing something about it. So taking that time, making sure that I left on time, that I was taking adequate lunch breaks, that I was taking adequate breaks and that I was leaving on time was huge. And that in itself took a lot of work. Like any addiction, it's going to take work to overcome and abstain from the unhealthy behaviors. Doing things for others and my community without expecting anything back in return. That is the key, right? When we measure our relationships with a scoreboard, it doesn't work. Because, you know, how many of us can live up to the subjective calculations of another? It's impossible. So learning to not use a scoreboard in my relationships was huge. And learning to do things, be of service without expecting anything in return has been um, a cathartic aha for me as well. Sacrificing short-term pleasures and coping with short-term discomforts when it helps me achieve longer-term gains. A lot of people have a challenge when it comes to goal setting. And I know we touched upon it a little bit during grade school days when teachers who uh, had experience in goal setting would share different exercises with students on how important it was to know what it was that you wanted in life. Because I know for a long time, I really didn't know what I wanted in life, right? I often quoted Shakespeare that uh, you know, the world is a stage and men and women merely players and we are expected to play a certain role. When I was a teenager, I didn't know what I wanted to do. By the time I was 18 and graduating high school, 
But we were expected to do something by societal constructs, uh, parental direction, whether it be, you know, even cultural, sometimes religious expectations. You're expected to play a role. And oftentimes trying to fit those constraints can lead to uh, great unhappiness and addictions, as it did with me. So when I found myself graduating, I mean, I barely made it through high school. I was not academically inclined. And back in those days, uh, I felt stupid and inferior. And I ended up quitting school in grade 10 and actually going back thanks to a teacher who reached out to me. So I repeated grade 10. But when I did go back, I went back in the general business program because I thought, you know what, I'm not university material. There's no way I can even imagine going on to university. But at least if I can get some business skills like shorthand and typing, then I've got a better chance of getting a job and feeling more productive and feeling less inferior. I mean, all my friends were going on to university. So immediately that set me apart. You know, I didn't have that in common with them anymore. So I think um, setting the goals was huge because I used to make myself sit down every five years and say, okay, what's the five-year um, vision that I have for my life? Not an easy thing to do because, you know, a lot of us don't take that time to really set those values for ourselves, set those goals. So I encourage you to, um, I mean, there's so much available online to help you to do that. And one of the prog one of the uh, the templates that it's available from Smart Recovery is called the Hierarchy of Values. It's a fantastic exercise to go through, and it helps you really focus on your core beliefs, your core values, and maybe even question them, uh, which is what you know we were never encouraged to do either. And three questions to ask and answer on a daily basis have really helped me stay focused on my goals and values, and that is, what do I want for my future? What am I doing about it? And how do I feel about what I'm doing about it? Really good introspective questions to ask and answer on a daily basis. Accepting the fallibility of others as well as ourselves. Oh my goodness, yes. Our, my fellow fallible humans, I often say now. Stop taking things personally using the C's strategy. Catch it, check it, change it. And being aware of what's within my control, that old hula hoop metaphor, right? Keeping that visual, what's within my hula hoop? What can I control and what's, with, what's beyond my control? Taking healthy risks, even when you might fail, right? We, I've been programmed to think that failure, I mean, I need to avoid it at all costs. But failure actually leads to flourishing, I have learned. And loss fertilizes the ground for gain. What other people think about you and what you are doing is none of your business. That's one of my favorite mantras from AA. What other people think of us is none of our business. I love that one. See uncertainty as a challenge because I've learned that the only real security in life lies in relishing life's insecurity. And the happiness in my life depends on the quality of my thoughts. So I work diligently to keep my thoughts as positive as possible. And not only my thoughts, I think it all begins with my words as well, because I really do believe, especially after learning that our English language dictionary contains three times as many negative words to positive words. So we actually have to work three times harder to even formulate positive thoughts. So I'm, once I become aware of that and I watch my language, am I using the positive words which are going to feed my positive thoughts? And then those positive thoughts, of course, are going to correlate into my feelings, my emotions, my moods, and all of that will correspond to my behaviors. So it all starts with words, thoughts, feelings, behaviors. So that's key. So building this toolbox of things that I can go to when I feel that my emotions are running high, like dealing with this grief process. Um, I'm grateful for the tools that are available to me from people like Dr. David Burns. I highly recommend that you check out his website, feelinggood.com and smartrecoverytoronto.com. You can have a wonderful um, 
access to resources there as well. Thanks so much for spending 30 minutes of your day with me. I really appreciate it. It means a lot. Remember to live fully, laugh often, love always, stay positive, and may the force be with you. Remember, you are the force.